Welcome to St. James. It's good that you guys are here. Uh, welcome to those watching on the live stream as well. Uh, it looks like we're, I know we're missing um, a bunch of uh, school age families uh, out of town on the long weekend, but I'm glad that you guys are here. Let me run over if I can just a few uh, notices real quick. Coming up this week, uh, men's Bible study Wednesday morning at 6.30, ladies Bible study Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. Also on Saturday, a couple of big things happening, and I think Tim's going to talk about this in a minute. We're at work day in the morning, and Tim's going to uh, speak to that in just a second. And then the youth group is leading a worship night here. Um, if the weather is not rainy, we're going to be meeting outside, and the youth group's going to be uh, leading music, and there's going to be uh, coffee and hot, cho- hot chocolate provided. That's at 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, please love to see you guys here for that. Um, speak with Stacy if you have questions about that. One more thing I want to uh, uh, clue you in on. Oh, so for, I'm, I'm supposed to say this, and I always forget every Sunday. Uh, fill out the guest registers at the end of the row and pass those along so other people can fill those out as well and let me know that you're here. Especially if you're visiting, let me know who you are and um, phone number, email address, uh, street address. I'd love to connect with you. Uh, so yes, one thing I, I, I do want to let you know about is um, on November 1st, and Cheryl's put a little sticker here in your bulletin, we're going to do something that we haven't done before, and this is just a kind of a shot in the dark to see if this is something that ministers to you guys or not. What we're going to do is it's a Wednesday evening. Youth group usually meets on Wednesday evening, so they'll be here 6.30 p.m. Join us downstairs. We're going to have a meal together, and uh, the community group that I'm a member of is providing the food. The youth group is going to provide a little bit of music. We're going to have a meal together. We're going to have communion as a part of that meal, like a fellowship meal, we're going to sing some songs and um, just hang out with each other. So please, uh, I'm going to probably figure out a way to find out how many of you are going to come to that in a few weeks, just so my community group has some sort of ballpark figure on how much food to make. Uh, but more on that coming up later. Okay, so Shanna is going to come and make an announcement, and then she's going to hand the baton off to Tim, and he's going to make an announcement, and then when he's done, we will stand and sing the opening hymn. Good morning. I am Shanna Covarrubias. I uh, am the deaconess of community groups here at St. James. So I'm going to invite you to become a part of a community group if you're not already a part of one. Uh, But when you hear the words community group, you're like, what does that even mean? Uh, Well, it means we're a group of individuals in the church and families in the church who come together usually once a week, sometimes every other week, Um, to be in community together. And that community involves fellowship time, getting to know other people really well, getting to know their entire family. It means Bible study together. We try to be in the Word all the time, but the way that we do Bible study depends on the specific group. So one of our groups right now is doing a book study. Another one of our groups has done like a video uh, scripture study, uh, like topical. Um, And some of our other groups uh, look at the text that was used for the sermon uh, during the week. And then we have some specific questions that can apply to any biblical text. Um, And then we discuss through those together uh, as a group. And then community group also involves prayer for each other, opening our hearts to the deepest struggles that we're facing and the things that we just need other people to come alongside us to walk through. Um, And community group is really, really at its core about getting to know people uh, so intimately in the way that God designed for us to be involved in other people's lives, serving each other, loving each other, ministering to each other, eating together, rejoicing together, crying together, all these things. So uh, right now we have community groups that meet on Monday nights, Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights, Thursday nights, Wednesday mornings. Uh, if you would like to get involved in one of those, you can email me at Shanna at stjamesglencarbon.org. Shanna is S-H-A-N-N-A at stjamesglencarbon.org. Um, and I will get you connected with a group that will best fit your needs. Um, babysitting is always provided for families with kids, so you do not need to worry about that as well. Uh, I really hope that you get involved in community. Good morning, St. James. Um, my name's Tim Schnicker, if you don't know me. I'm here on behalf of the property team. You know what that means? Well, we have our fall cleanup coming on Saturday. I'm here to invite you to come out and spend a few hours in the morning 
to get your weekend off, started off good in serving and maybe getting your hands a little dirty. We have some things to, uh, we'd like to take care of before the winter and uh, some small tasks. I promise we won't overwork you. We'll have you out of here by maybe noon so you can have the rest of your weekend. But way to get it off, kicked off and a good way to get your weekend going. Come out and give us a hand. We got to take care of our property. It's all our house here. So look forward to seeing you there. continue in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. 
Let's pray and ask God to forgive our sins. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Upon this, your confession, I announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. You may be seated. Psalm reading's kind of long, so we'll, um, you guys can take it easy during this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You've rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 52 and 53. This is maybe the most important text in the Old Testament for Jesus' understanding of who he of his own sense of mission, of his own self. Psalm 22 is very important too, but Isaiah 52 and 53 is key. And, and as I read through here, and we've read through this text before in here, a lot of you will recognize this language. It gets quoted a ton in the New Testament, including in the epistle reading that we're about to read in a second as well. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Remember that word good news is actually in, in the original text, just gospel. Who publishes peace, who brings gospel of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns, God is king again. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice, together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. He's uh, talking about the city of Babylon where uh, God's people are exiles at the moment. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go in flight. For the Lord will go before you, And the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Epistle reading is 1 Peter 2, 9-25. It begins with the reference to Exodus 19, where Moses tells the people of Israel that God has called you to be a chosen race, a holy priesthood. And it ends by echoing Isaiah 53, which we just read. Peter speaks to the church, and he says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's a reference to Hosea. Behold, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, So when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the sermon hymn.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 24. Glory to you, O Lord. Now this is after Jesus rose from the dead. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What's this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. We'd hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they'd even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they didn't see. And Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's towards evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. may be seated. In the beginning, God created this big, beautiful universe, a universe that was designed to display his glory, his holiness, his righteousness. He put, especially as as special creatures in the middle of this universe, he put his human image bearers, Adam and Eve. They were designed to, in ways that no other part of creation was designed to do, designed to reflect his image to the rest of the creation and to each other. Adam and Eve and the rest of us, like our grandfathers and mothers, Adam and Eve, have failed in that calling. We've turned in on ourselves. We've rebelled against God. And now we don't reflect him the way we should anymore. God comes up with a plan way back in Genesis 3 to fix this problem, though. And that includes promising to Eve that someday one of her offspring would rescue the whole world. 
He calls Abram uh, a few chapters later and says, Abram, you're, you're, you, you and your offspring are gonna rescue the whole world. I'm gonna use you to bring blessing to the whole world. Abram is called to be the image bearer, the kingdom of priests that Adam and Eve were called to be and couldn't be. But Abraham and his family, like us, failed in that calling as well. God gave them a king. He gave them Torah. He gave them scripture. He gave them his presence in the temple. He gave them covenants. And yet they failed him. And that brought us last week to the absolute nadir, the absolute bottom of the story, the lowest point that God's people get to, which was exile because they rebelled against God and worshiped false gods, did not reflect who he was to the creation around them. God sent them into exile in Babylon. 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar and his army shows up, blows up the temple, takes a lot of God's people to Babylon where they establish a Jewish quarter there. That was what we were reading about when we read Psalm 88 last week, which is completely hopeless. A Psalm which has absolutely no redeeming value in it just by itself. Why? That's the question at the end of the Psalm. Why are you doing this, God? And that's where we stopped last week. And that's the connection with the turning point that we're hitting this week, which is the good news of Jesus. So we've spent a lot of weeks on the Old Testament stuff, and now this week, uh, and, and I, 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 you guys have noticed this too, I've included Jesus in every single one of these sermons because it's not really a Christian sermon if you don't connect it to Jesus. If this wasn't a series of sermons, if it was just a Bible study like we do for the new members class, those of you who've been through the new members class, I'll just start at the beginning and not, like and hold Jesus back. And so that sounds horrible, doesn't it? Like I'll keep him sort of back behind the scenes until we get to the first Christmas morning when he's born and then use him to explain everything that we've read so far. But that's where we're at. We're at this Jesus. And especially the link, here's a couple of links here. One of the big ones is Psalm 22, verse one, which I talked about last Sunday in the sermon, which we read at the beginning of the service this morning. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That question Jesus' question on the cross is the same question that the psalmist in exile in Psalm 88 asks. Why, God? Why have you done this? That's our connection. And the answer is, the answer is, is that the Messiah had to suffer. The Messiah had to suffer. Here's the second link. In the gospel reading, which we just read a minute ago, Jesus asked this question, verse 26. Was it not necessary that the Messiah the one anointed king, the one who's going to replace David. Remember, we talked about several weeks ago. Was it not necessary that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Wasn't it necessary that, that God's son had to suffer for the kingdom to be brought about? Now, and then the, the next line is, this, this also links us to it. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's kind of what the sermon series is about. You begin with Moses and all the prophets and think about where is Jesus in this story? How does this story tell the story of Jesus? Not just the story of Jesus, but the story of restored humanity and our salvation and the renewed call to once again be the image bearers that God called us to be in the garden, but we failed to be. And how now through the power of the Holy Spirit and the resurrected Jesus, he's equipping us to be the God reflectors that he designed us to be. This is the story that Jesus is telling the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets. The heart of that story, though, is the Messiah had to suffer. Now, I had a a, a New Testament professor in a PhD seminar who asked the group, where in the Old Testament does it say the Messiah had to suffer? And the answer is, there's really not, you can't find a proof text. There's not like one verse, you know, looking... Ezekiel, and it says, oh, the Messiah must suffer. There it is. It's actually just baked in to the whole story. It's a part of the rhythm of Old Testament expectations. It's a part of the way they saw themselves and their hope for redemption. And I'm gonna, we're going to look at two texts this morning, and we are not going to dig down deep into these texts, although they are very much worthwhile, worth digging down deep into. We're gonna, I'm just going to show you the arc of these texts and how they tell the story about how if things were going to get fixed, God's chosen one had to suffer. All right? So let's look at these real quick. Psalm 22, that's our psalm for this morning. Um, And flip back there in the bulletin, or if you're looking in your Bible, Psalm 22. And we're not going to look at all of this. I'm just going to point out to you the arc of the story story that Psalm 22 is telling. Psalm 22 starts off really bad. Whoever it is, the, 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 the psalmist here is saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, now you guys know this, those of you who, who are, are familiar with the New Testament. 
you know that this is what Jesus says from the cross. As his father turns his back on him, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, the question is, is Jesus like, oh, I remember this Bible verse from when I was a kid, Psalm 22.1, maybe I'll quote that now. Probably not. Jesus, though, has spent his life filling his brain up and his heart up with Psalm 22. And in the moment when God the Father turns his back on his own son, he has all of that built into him. He sees in that moment that that is his destiny, that he has reached the crisis point that he was sent to earth for, and he can't help but pull Psalm 22 up to his lips in that moment. Why Psalm 22, though? Well, he said, God forsook him, and so he says, my God, my God, why forsake But that's not the complete story of Psalm 22. The story of Psalm 22 comes to us in three parts, real broadly here. The first part is starting with verse one and going down to roughly verse you know, 18-ish. It's bad news. God has forsaken him. He trusted in him, but like his fathers, God delivered them, but not me. I'm a worm and not a man. I'm scorned by all mankind and despised by people. Everybody mocks me. They all say, trust in the Lord. Let, let the Lord deliver you since you're, since you're so buddy-buddy with God. Why don't you just trust in him and he'll deliver you? They're being sarcastic with me. Many bulls are encompassing me. They open wide their mouths. I'm poured out like water. My heart's like wax. Dogs encompass me. They've pierced my hands and feet. They divide my garments. This is all bad news. God has abandoned the psalmist here, the chosen one. God's abandoned him. But second part of the psalm that you need to know about, there is a turning point in verse 21. Look at verse 21. It's this continued prayer. Save me from the mouth of the lion. But now, check it out. There's a turning point. It's not a prayer to do something, but it's, it turns into a prayer acknowledging that something has been done. It starts off with save me, and it ends with you have saved me. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. That's the second turning point. That, that, that's the second part. That's the turning point in the psalm. The Messiah must suffer, but there's going to be a turning point where that suffering turns. He's rescued by the Father, and what that turns into is, and that's the third half of the psalm. Again, we're not going to dig into this, but let me just point out to you verses 27 and 28. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. So it's, 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 it's an odd, it's, it's, it's almost a blur of a psalm. It starts off with God's chosen one being abandoned. It ends with all the nations bowing down to God as the one true king. And in the middle, there's this turning point where this suffering one carries the weight of this suffering, cries out to the Lord for help. The Lord delivers him, and that deliverance turns into salvation for all the nations. Right? That's a story that's built into the Old Testament, is that God will save the nations. The promises that he made to Abraham, that he's going to bring blessing to the whole world, will happen, but it will happen somehow through the suffering of this chosen, abandoned one. All right, flip over to the Old Testament reading. Very, very similar story, only the ark is backwards here. It begins with kingdom. It begins with kingship, Isaiah 52, uh, verses 7 through uh, 12, where God's people are in exile. The people who are back home in Jerusalem, looking out over the, the city walls, see a messenger running over the hills to deliver a message. This messenger runs into the city and announces, our God is king again. Your God reigns, Isaiah 52, 7. That's gospel. What does that mean? It means all the bad gods, all the Nebuchadnezzars of the world, all of the Caesars of the world, all the Hitlers of the world, all the bad presidents, all the bad CEOs, all the bad cultural leaders are no longer in charge, and now our God reigns like the end of Psalm 22, right? Well, how does this happen? How does God reign? How does he bear his holy arm in verse 10? The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. How has he done that? How has he, you guys know, that's, that's gym language. It's, it works the same in Hebrew as it does in English. To flex. How, how has he bared his holy arm in front of the nations? Well, go down to verse, uh, verse one of chapter 53. It's about uh, nine or 10 lines down. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Well, then it tells the story of this one who grew up before him like a young plant, no beauty. He was esteemed. He wasn't esteemed. Verse four, surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. So this is the same story that Psalm 22 tells, only it's in reverse. It starts off with the kingdom and then explains how the kingdom got here. God is going to rule and reign over all things. How's he gonna do it? How's he gonna flex? He's gonna flex to this one who's no flex at all. 
suffering servant who was so beat up and so mistreated that we all looked at him and thought, God does not like that guy. Then at some point we realized, wait a minute, he's bruised for my sins. He's being punished for my iniquities. He's being beat up because I need to be fixed. So this story, see, you guys understand, this is a story that's built in to the story of the Bible, that the Messiah, the chosen one, must suffer. Now, are there alternatives? Could God have done it differently? When Adam and Eve sinned, could God have come with like this huge, massive army and fixed the problem? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I guess so. He could do whatever he wants. But somehow he's chosen to fix the problems of the entire world through the suffering of himself, through the suffering of his own son. That's what Jesus is doing. Jesus brings about the kingdom, but he does it through his own self-sacrifice. He does it through being wounded for us. Now, if, if you're honest with yourself, and whether you're, those of you who are Christians, those of you who are not Christians, you all fit into this boat. There's something deep within your heart that taps into this. There's something deep within your heart that, 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 that reaches out and grabs onto this. We tell ourselves stories about people who've committed great acts of self-sacrifice. And we might not envy those people, but there's something about those stories. It's a story of a firefighter who goes into a burning building to rescue a baby, risk their own life, maybe even suffer severe injury. And there's something about us that says, yes, that is deeply valued. That's way more valuable than like my team winning the game this afternoon, which is fun. It's a great story. But there's something about that, that deep self-sacrifice, which my heart links with. We, we, you'll, you'll hear a story sometime about a spouse who's been married to, to, to their spouse for forever, you know, and then the, the, the one spouse gets Alzheimer's. And the other spouse, the healthy spouse, spends their last remaining retirement years not playing golf or traveling in Europe, but caring deeply for this spouse who doesn't even remember them. And when that happens, you say, oh, that's so, that's powerful. That's, there's something beautiful, deeply beautiful and wonderful about that. What is, it, what, what is it that causes us to do that, whether you're a Christian or non-Christian? I'll tell you what it is. There's something deep down inside each one of us that knows self-sacrifice is our only hope. Somebody needs to sacrifice themselves for us. There's something that craves, we all crave, there being somebody that when I get Alzheimer's, there will be somebody who loves me enough to give themselves up to care for me. That if I was trapped in a burning building, I would want to know that one of you loved me so much that you would consider my life worth your life. It's hard to find people like that. Okay? It's almost impossible. And yet, this is the story that's built into the heart of the Bible, is that God is that person. God's the person who sacrificed. God is not the Wizard of Oz. He's not pulling cords and pressing buttons and causing lightning here, and somebody wins the lottery here, and the Cardinals finish in last place here, and that sort of thing. God throws himself into the middle of the story as a character, as one of us, as a normal dude, not as like this world-famous entertainer, not as like the most brilliant CEO ever, not as the king of a thousand armies, but as a construction worker so that he can die and sacrifice for us. It's the story that's built right into the heart of the Bible. Okay, why? I'll give you three reasons why, and there's probably more. These are just three that came to the top of my head as I was studying this week. One is, uh, you know, why would, he, why would God choose to suffer like this? Why would he choose to suffer? One is, he wants to define divine strength in terms of self-sacrifice. So th so it's tempting to think of God as like the Wizard of Oz sometimes, like this all-powerful being who presses all the buttons and, you know, makes the tidal waves happen and things like that. And I'm not saying that that's not true, but the way that God chooses to, divine, to define himself to us is differently. He defines himself in terms of weakness. He, he chooses to become an infant who has to be breastfed to survive, who has to have his poopy butt wiped in order to be clean. This is what God subjects himself to for us. That's not, you can call that weakness. It is, of course, weakness. Being a little baby, is, you can't get around that it's weak. But that is divine power. The divine power of self-sacrifice. The divine power of divine weakness. God defines strength in those terms. And what that means for us is, is that from now on, you and I, those of you who are Christians, if you're not a Christian, hopefully you're on your way here. But for those of us who are Christians, we can no longer talk of strength 
in terms of the world's definition of strength. It has to be in terms of Jesus' definition of strength. Strength through weakness. The kind of strength that the, that the Apostle Paul embodies in 2 Corinthians. Remember this text we read last week where he says, I am the apostle. I'm the apostle that you should believe and follow Corinthian church because I have all the credentials of a great apostle. I've been beaten up 14 times, been shipwrecked. I had five times people tried to stone me. Nobody likes me. I'm a horrible public speaker. That's the proof that he has, and he caps it off with, because when I am weak, then I'm strong. I find my strength in my weakness, which highlights Jesus' strength through me. So divine, divine, divine strength has to be defined in terms of self-sacrifice. Second, Jesus is Jesus self-sacrifices because that's his way of saving the world without destroying it. It's his one way of saving the world without destroying it. So what are his alternatives? You guys have seen houses before like this, houses that maybe once were beautiful. So I, I, I lived in Alton for a period of time. And for those of you who are from Alton, you'll be aware of the McPike Mansion. And it's kind of sat there at the top of Albee Street for a long time. And it's been abandoned for a long time. And there's always people who are buying it and selling it, buying it and selling it. And they're going to fix it. It's this big, beautiful house that the mayor of Alton owned back in the 19th century. It's completely falling down. And people will buy it and try and bolster it. Because there's this sense that it's worth saving. But almost everybody in Alton knows that at some point it's just going to have to be torn down. Because the cost to save it is too much. It's just going to have to be bulldozed. And it's sad. But sometimes things are so bad, that's all you can do. It's just bulldoze it and start over. Sometimes your lucky t-shirt has to be thrown away. There's nothing you can do to save it. God could do that. The world could be corrupted by sin in Genesis 3, and God could say, this is too much. Let's just blow it up and maybe start over again. But he doesn't do that. He could do that. So it's the difference between a, 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 a it's the difference between a violent criminal thrusting their knife into somebody in order to kill them and a surgeon taking their scalpel and opening somebody up in order to save them. And I, know, I, I realize I, I, I tinkered around with that illustration last week. You'll excuse me if I borrow it again for this week. They're both knife cuts. They both are drawing blood. They both cause pain and suffering to the person who's experiencing them. But one is done for the purpose of destruction, to, to get rid of whoever it is that's being stabbed. And the other is done for the purpose of saving. Now, what if there was a surgeon and the surgeon realized that in this world there are tons of diseases, there's tons of cancers, tons of sicknesses, and the surgeon thought, it's not a true story by the way, the surgeon knew that I could, by some sort of deep magic, combine all the cancers, all the sicknesses, all the diseases of the world into the body of my son. And I could perform surgery on my son and in one fell swoop take out all the diseases and all the sicknesses in the world. What if there was a surgeon who could do that? Would you call that surgeon cruel for cutting his son open? Or would you say that's the most self-sacrificial loving thing any family has ever done in the history of the universe? This is why the Messiah must suffer. is because the only way to get rid of the evil and the brokenness and the sin of the world, deep as it is, is to either blow the whole thing up or to do some sort of deep radical surgery on himself. And he chooses option two, self-sacrificial love. Third is this, to leave us a pattern for living lives of real biblical strength. Not strength in the world's terms, but strength in God's terms. He leaves us a pattern for this. Now, look over at 1 Peter 2. This is a, we're going to just fly over of this text as well. I'm going to give you a handful of applications, and then we'll be done. I, I kept you here a long time last Sunday. I remember that. Thank you for coming back, those of you who were here last Sunday. I'm going to try and be a little bit easier on you this Sunday. Uh, I'll try to, uh, to pay you back for it. First Peter 2. And again, there's so much to look at in this text, but this is just a brief flyover. But I want you to see what Peter does. He says this. He starts off with kingdom, the Lord ruling and reigning. And he says, this is you guys. You are a part of the rule and reign of God. In verse 9, you are a chosen race, a royal, it's a kingdom, priesthood. You are working for God. You are now Christians. You are the image bearers that God wanted Adam and Eve to be. God is repairing you so that you can reflect him. So okay, pause. I'm going to get 30 seconds to do this. When, 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 when the Bible talks about being good, this is not about like, oh, you need to not have fun or you need to do all these good deeds so that you can help people out. You need to do all these good deeds so that God will be happy with you. It's not what the Bible is doing. When the Bible talks about holiness, it means this. 
God designed us from the very beginning to reflect him. And all he's doing is trying to create us, recreate us and shape us so that we once again look like him. That we once again love outside of ourselves. That we once again are holy. That we once again value others more than ourselves. That's what's going on here. And verse nine in 1 Peter 2 says, that's who you are. God has created you to be this way. You now rule over the whole world. You are a combination. Christians, you are a combination. Kings and queens and priests and priestesses of the whole world. How do you do this? Answer, you submit to bad rulers, verse 13 and following. You submit to bad bosses, verses 18 and following. You don't submit to bad bo- you don't submit to your boss. You don't do what the boss tells you to do because he or she is a good boss. You do it, it's even better, Peter says, when they're a bad boss and you submit to them because you are a God reflector. What's he saying? He's saying that the kingdom is exercised through our weakness. This works for the Christian church too. As with Jesus, now so with those of us who've been baptized into Jesus. When we are weak, the kingdom of God is strong. And that's why at the end of this text, starting in verse 21, Peter says, this is who you are. You are the Isaiah 53 guy now that you've been plugged into Jesus. Now that Jesus has died and risen from the dead, This is you. You've been called to this, he says in verse 20, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found. And there's this echo, I'm not gonna read it again. Down through verse 25, this this barrage of echoes from Isaiah 53. The main point is this, though. If you want verse nine, if you want the kingdom, if you wanna be a royal race and a chosen priesthood, if you wanna be a God reflector, the path through that is the path of the cross. Baptized into Jesus Christ, now we suffer for each other. If you wanted to go on, if we wanted to keep on reading in 1 Peter 3, we could see he says, submitting to a bad spouse. Not, not, just, not, not just honoring and loving and submitting to our good spouses, but especially when our spouses are bad. That's a way to be a God reflect. That's a way to exercise kingdom power. Now some people are like, that's not, this is not kingdom power. Like obeying a bad boss, obeying bad government, obeying a bad spouse, that's not power, that's weakness. Okay, yeah, but in the world's terms, that's right. But in, in the economy of Jesus, it's flipped around. It's, it's weakness, yes, but it is power. It's the power of the kingdom. Now, there's way more to say there. There's way more to unpack about what that would look like in your day-to-day life. I'm not calling anybody in here to, to cooperate in somebody else's sin against you. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not what Peter's talking about. But what he is saying, though, is that submission, suffering, because there are bad people in the world, is how God exercises authority. It's what Jesus did. The Caesars and the Herods of the world killed him, and that's actually how the kingdom of God got started. All right, now, applications, and then we'll be done. And I've got a list of them here, and um, I'm gonna look, those of you who, uh, you know who you are, you are good at giving me the nonverbal clues that I've preached too long. You know who you are, we've discussed this. I'm counting on you to give me those clues uh, here in a second. I'm gonna go through these, I'll see how many of I get, to, get through. The first one, though, I'm gonna have to say, trust Jesus. Any attempts for me and you to justify ourselves are not going to work because all of our attempts to justify ourselves will be done on the world's terms of strength, job success. That's, it, it, is, what, is what gets me up in the morning where I can look in the mirror and say, Aaron Miller, you have value. Is that career success? But, but, but and you guys know this too. I'm not saying that career success is bad. I'm saying as a means of self-justification, as a means of finding my worth, that's the way it works in the world. But that's just weakness in God's economy. It can never, ever have enough success to justify my own existence. Relationship success, financial success, academic success, being good looking, whatever it is. I've I've talked about these before. All these are, it's not bad to be good looking, to be funny, to have money, to have a good job, to have great relationships. Those are all wonderful, great things that God has given you and you should enjoy. But if you say to yourself, that's how I have value, then you're justifying yourself. Go to the cross. Go to the way which you would never, ju- you would never go to the execution of a criminal. Look at that executed criminal and say, that's my meaning and purpose. But that's what I'm asking you to do this morning. That's what the Bible's asking you to do this morning. The Messiah had to suffer for the kingdom to come about. Okay, that's the main one. All right, here's a couple of uh, ones. And some of these are top down and some of these are bottom up and you'll know when you hear them. Uh, a lot of you have failed. All of us have failed to some extent, but a lot of you have had significant failures in your life. You failed in marriage. Lots of you were on 
not your first marriage, but some of you are single because you've been divorced. Some of you have failed in business. A lot of us have failed in friendship. Some of you have failed in parenting. And now you feel disqualified from whatever because I botched it. I screwed this thing up. I botched this marriage or I botched this business opportunity or I botched this chance to parent these kids. Jesus was disqualified for you. Jesus did the big botching for you so that now you have value. You have not been disqualified. You have not, I'm not saying that there's no such thing as botching stuff up, but that does not take your worth away at all because Jesus experienced that on your behalf. He experienced that on your behalf. It's related to this. And, um, this is important for me to say, so just pay attention for a second. Because of this, we at St. James should be transparent about, and I'm talking to church members now, we should be transparent about our brokenness and sinfulness. We need to be open. You know, there's, there's points where you don't tell everything you know about yourself, but we need to be open about how we are broken people. We are people who've botched up marriages. We are people who've botched up businesses. We are people who've botched up friendships and business opportunities and relationships with our parents. We are the people who've done that. Because I'll be honest with you, it's a very important thing for me to say. Your goodness, your self-righteousness oppresses me. It makes me sick that you have such wonderful marriages, that you are such wonderful people, that you always do and say the right thing. You know what liberates me? Is when I know that you need the exact same grace of God in your marriages and in your businesses and in your friendships and in your parenting that I do. And as long as we walk around here like we got it all together, like I do everything right, all my family's super happy, they think I'm the best husband and dad in the world, I'm super successful at everything I do. We're living a lie that tells everybody else, you're not good enough. But if I can, from this pulpit, be transparent about the, the ways that I have deeply screwed up my own life, what that tells you guys is, is that the answer is not living a great life or being a great husband or a great pastor or a great businessman or a great father or a great friend. That the key to life is Jesus' sacrifice for us in his resurrection. We call that Grace. We talk about grace a lot in churches like ours, but then we live like grace isn't real, like we have it all together. And what we, you and I need to do is we need to commit. Now, Shannon was talking about community groups. This is a great way to do this, is to, I'm gonna be transparent and open about my own weakness, weaknesses and brokennesses, not because I'm not like gonna go on some sort of guilt trip where people will pat me and say, they're there. Whenever I tell you guys about things that I've screwed up, frequently people will walk through that door and be like, you're doing okay, but that's not the point. I'm not looking for an attaboy or I'm not fishing for like a compliment. What I'm doing is telling you, I need Jesus. Like all the ways that the world can be successful, I've tried those ways. I, I've never ever reached the top in any sort of those categories. In fact, I've frequently fallen below them. What has rescued me though is that God has been very radically good to me in Jesus Christ. If I can live that life in front of you, if you can live that life in front of me, St. James would be an amazing place. We would actually start to heal. Those of you who are too ashamed of the things that you've done, the things you've experienced, and the things that you've thought and said would start to heal and know Jesus took all that. I have deep value regardless. This goes for doubts too. St. James needs to be a place where people can have doubts. Every single one of you in here has doubts about Christianity. When we act like, oh, we're the people who know everything. When I act like, well, I'm a pastor, I know everything. What I do is I tell you that intellectual certainty is the path to success. And it's not. We need to be a place where we can share our struggles with who God has called us to be. All right. Um, along the lines of uh, uh, strength through weakness in the church, we need to use Jesus' defin definition of strength to define our mission here. What does it mean to be successful at the mission that God has called St. James to be on? Some of you uh, listened uh, along with me to uh, the Mars Hill podcast that Christianity Today put out uh, a year ago about a um, big church plant turned into a mega church in Seattle uh, called Mars Hill, and their pastor, who was the pastor there. The church starts off, it's in, in, and it's a good church. It's not, there, there'd be stuff that we disagreed with them about theologically, but it's a solid theological church. It starts to get big. It starts to get strong in worldly terms. And the next thing you know, the personality of the pastor the dynamics of its ministries, the power of its internet footprint 
become the thing that make it a powerful church. And it fails eventually. The church falls apart and all of its satellite campuses fall apart because that's not the way God works. You don't judge a church by that sort of definition of strength. You judge it by weakness. Are we people who are transparent about our brokenness? Are we people who are willing to suffer along with Glenn Carvin? That's what strength is. Are we people who are able to, that, that not able, that's the wrong word. Are we people who have been graced by God to live a cross-shaped life in our community? That's the strength of Jesus. All right, a couple more things here. Uh, let me pick out some things. Um, uh, senior citizens, culture tells you that your value is over because you no longer produce. Now, if you produced enough when you were working, now you've got enough to retire on and go somewhere and enjoy that. But your value is no longer, you know, this, no, no, nobody makes music for you. Nobody makes TV shows or movies about you. Nobody makes clothing lines designed for you. You just go away. That is the way the world judges strength. It's not the way God judges strength. Those of you who are seniors, now is the time. Now is the time to start serving the Lord in the midst of your weakness. Serve the Lord out of that. That's the most powerful thing you can do. Related to that, uh, don't hide your sickness. Don't hide your sickness. It's this big thing, especially for those of you who are the older generation, you get sick, I don't tell anybody. I keep that to myself. Why would you hide your own brokenness and sickness from the rest of us? If the most powerful event in the history of the universe is the death of God, then certainly your impending death can be a place out of which his glory works. Don't cut me off from that. I need, I've been commanded by my Savior to weep with those who weep. Don't deny me that opportunity to weep with you, to walk with you through your mortality. That's, I, I will never know Jesus more powerfully than, we are, than when we are experiencing dying in Jesus. Don't, don't be sick in silence. Don't hush it up because that's what the greatest generation did. We didn't tell anybody about our weaknesses. That's what I'm arguing against. That's the world's definition of strength. God loved the greatest generation. But that definition of strength is not biblical. Um, uh, let me do, uh, let's do uh, just one more, and then we'll be done. It's kind of, a, a sermon's kind of petering out slowly. I should like, I should like have a, a poem or a song to quote to you, like for slam bang finish. I don't though. Uh, men, we are to be strong and lead our families. That's, that's, that's considered to be toxic now to say those sorts of things. But the reason why it's considered to be toxic is because if you say that, we should be strong and lead our families, and you use the world's definition of strength, it is toxic. Like, I will be in charge. These people will do what I say. I make the final call here. That's the way the world thinks of power. That's the CEO model. But if we think of leading and being strong in terms of Jesus, in terms of like what Paul says in Ephesians, husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, if that's our definition of strength, is that we can be strong enough to sacrifice ourselves for our wives and our kids. We will make ourselves the slaves of our family. That's gospel stuff. And Angela can tell you, I'm not good at this. I'm preaching it myself right now. That's gospel-centered power. The power of being a servant to your, to, to your wife and to your kids. Man, we need to like not be abandoning this mission of being strong leaders because it's too toxic, but being embra be embracing a cross-shaped vision of what it means to be a strong leader because that's what the cru crucifixion of Jesus does. It's strength through death. It's strength through weakness. It's strength through self-sacrifice. That's what God, so let me, let me just end with a little bit of gospel, then we'll go to communion. That's what God has offered you guys, his willingness to sacrifice himself for us, to save us, to rescue us. That's what he's called us to look like. He's called us to look like him, to be God reflectors, to be image bearers. And now as we hear his word and now as we come forward for communion, those of you who are believers, let's fill up on that. Let's go to the cross. Let's go to the crucified Jesus for our source of real, genuine biblical strength. All right, let me pray for us. God, thank you for loving us and for being a good God and just continue to uh, be, be reshaping and reordering, reordering our minds, Father, so that we see your strength, your strength through the weakness of your crucified son, Jesus, as the true definition. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
Please stand for prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being such a good God and for loving us, and thank you for accommodating yourself to our weakness, accommodating yourself to our sinfulness even, and taking upon our brokenness and our sickness and our mortality and our deep rebellion against you and our deep sinfulness into your Son, Jesus Christ, and rescuing us from the problem that we have caused, Lord, in your mercy. Father, I pray that you be with all of us who are struggling with weakness, and that's every single one of us in here, Lord. We're, a lot of us are struggling with physical health issues and mental health issues and sins that we just can't shake and worries about money and relationships that, we've, that are broken that we've participated in breaking, and sometimes we haven't participated in breaking. And God, in all those areas of weaknesses, would you show yourself strong? Would your with the power of your Holy Spirit, working the benefits of your Son's death and resurrection. Would it heal us? Lord, would you please meet us in our needs and, and by your strength and by your power, give us your grace uh, for righteousness and holiness and salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we pray that you would be with the missions of St. James and that you would continue blessing us and what you've called us to be here in this community and um, what you've called us to be here in loving and serving each other, and that you would continue to lead the way, that you would open the doors that you want us to go through, that you would uh, bring in our path the people that you want us to minister to and serve, 
that you would, uh, by your sovereign love, be rescuing Glenn Carbon back to yourself and that you would allow us to be able to have front row seats to witness that and even participate in it by your grace. Lord, in your mercy. We pray all these things because you've invited us to pray these prayers, Lord, that you've called us your daughters and sons and you've united us to your son, Jesus Christ, and you've brought us into your throne room. And so we come boldly and pray these prayers in the name of our brother, your son, Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith now with the words of the Nicene Creed. This is in your bulletin. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation. For you've had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But mainly we're bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Passover Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world, who by his death has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Now let's pray in Jesus' name the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. and When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
triumphed o'er the grave and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and Please stand. And now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in God's peace. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Uh, the people who weren't here today, don't tell them about how long we went over this time too. We'll just keep that our secret. Make sure you're connecting with people that you don't recognize or haven't talked to in a while. Make everybody feel welcome. Go in God's peace.